she also has been a pioneer in bringing the role of Glia to the story. And she began this research, this pioneering research, in the early 1990s. Now, since then, a number of labs all around the world, independently, have now extended this research and have contributed in their way how glia additionally are important for mediating, for creating neuropathic pain or pathological pain states. In contribute or in recognition of Dr. Watkins' extraordinary contributions to the pain field, she has been awarded many, she has been recognized by many different awards, including the Prince of Asturias Award for Technical and Scientific Research from the Prince of Asturias Foundation in Spain, the Clinical Science Award and Lectureship from the Karolinska Institute and Karolinska University in Stockholm, Sweden, and the FWL Care Distinguished Basic Science Research Award from the American Pain Society. That's just to name a few. Dr. Watkins was selected in 2006 as the University of Colorado's Distinguished Professor, which is the highest honor that a university can give in recognition of research, service, and teaching. And I want to note here the word excellence in teaching. That is an understatement. Dr. Watkins is well known by her students, her postdocs, and anybody who's worked with her that she is extraordinary as a mentor and as a teacher. So without any further comment, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Linda Watkins, and who will speak to us on the role of glia in pain. So can everybody hear me who wants to? <laughs> okay. So what I want to do tonight is weave together a story for you that we're really excited about. It's one we've been working on, not for 10 years, thank you, but much closer to 20. And the story is, is going to show you some surprising things. And what it's going to be pointing at is that cells other than neurons, cells other than neurons, are critically important in the creation and maintenance of chronic pain, dysregulating the actions of opiates, and now dysregulating the actions of a variety of drugs of abuse as well. So with this talk, what the story comes with is a plea. And this is a plea to this group because this group has both the interest and the skills to be able to make this happen. And this plea has to do with the fact that I'm hoping to convince you tonight that there is a very great need to be able to dynamically image um, the glial cells, that there is a great need to activate glial cells of a variety of types, astrocytes being imaged separately from microglial cells. And there's other types of glial cells like satellite glial cells and oligodendroglia and so on that we're learning are also contributing to uh, the neuroinflammatory environment. And what, one of the things that we find very exciting and I'll be showing you data on is that it's not even just glial cells that are going to turn in to be the culprits, but also endothelial cells, the cells that make up the insides of the blood vessels in your brain are also, when they become activated, contributing to this neuroinflammatory state. And so we have to cast a much wider net when we're talking about how do we image this dynamic process and to really understand in living tissues and hopefully in people what these cells are really doing. Now, what the cells historically have been studied um, in terms of things like the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor, which has come to be called uh, TSP, uh, TSPO for translocator protein. And it's been shown in the animals that this kind of uh, activation marker and many others are upregulated when these cells become activated. But showing this in people has been a challenge. And there's a few bits out there in terms of pain, opiates, and so forth. And this is just one example um, where they have shown that in the contralateral thalamus, which is 
anatomically correct in terms of placement that years after a phantom limb injury, phantom limb uh, development of a chronic pain state for, for, for many, many years, they still can see these glial cells becoming, uh, remaining activated within this brain region. But this is just the beginning. So much more needs to be done. And the problem that arises as people, as people who do this kind of imaging work know is that there are a lot of problems with reagents so far. So while people have been focusing in on this uh, TSPO, this peripheral benzodiazepine receptor type of a ligand, there's a lot of problems with the development of the compounds. A lot of stumbling blocks along the way. And on top of that, that I'll be telling you about endothelial cells, uh, the lining of your blood vessels that are becoming neuroinflamed and contributing to this whole ganesh, there are no agents for that. So why is it that I'm standing up here saying we need these compounds? Well, I want to try to convince you of the need of these compounds by telling you a story. And it's going to be a story about non-neuronal cells and the non-neuronal cells input into chronic pain states, dysregulating opiates and other drugs of abuse. So what I want to do is interest you in just a few global concepts. The first has to do with how we conceptualize pathological pain. In pathological pain, hot, cold, heart pressure pains are greatly amplified. Warm, cool, and light touch are now perceived as pain. Classically, every model used to understand such pain has focused exclusively on neurons. These immune cells, these immune-like glial cells, had no role as they were not thought of in terms of neuronal signaling. But now it's very clear that these cells are both important in the creation as well as the maintenance of such pathological pain states. And indeed, beyond even chronic pain, it's now I, I recognized that these cells are driving some of the problems with opiates. That is, that they prevent opiates from having their full analgesic effects. They contribute to a lot of the negative consequences of taking drugs that you're trying to use to control pain. And it now goes further with all of these other drugs of abuse as well. But what's exciting is the clinical implications, I th would think are uh, very profound in terms of the recognition of this new class of cell being involved, opens up whole new avenues for approaching pain control. And what's very exciting, as we'll talk about a little bit during the talk, is that now it is just beginning that these glial targeting compounds are approaching clinical trials. And that bodes for a whole new day in pain control. Now the original focus, the classical focus on neurons has been really quite reasonable. It was an obvious thing to focus on at first because the concept of pathological pain is using neuropathic pain as an example. Nerve damage would then get amplified um, along the, the neural circuit by having pain amplification by neurons at each step of the way. But now what we know is that within the spinal cord in particular, you now have this family of glial cells, these non-neuronal cells that are becoming activated under these conditions, and they are helping to create and maintain this pathological pain state. So if that's true, what is it that we know? What we know, what is striking to me, what we know is across every laboratory, across all of these animal models, across all the different ways that people can do pain testing, the same answer comes up. The same answer is that these glial cells are becoming activated under the conditions of every single clinically relevant animal model. And further, that if you block the glial activation or you block the pro-inflammatory products, you will block the pain in every single clinically relevant animal model. And you don't cause them to become analgesic. You don't cause them to become totally oblivious to pain. What you do is you return them to normal. And that is a very important concept, that you want the organism to be normal, not to be oblivious to their environment. And beyond that, beyond pain, what we now know is that these glial cells are dysregulating opiates. What the data say 
is that if you block glial activation, you will improve opiate analgesia. You will make it better for pain control. At the same time, you block tolerance, block dependence, block drug abuse, block respiratory depression, and even opiate-induced constipation, which is a huge problem for patients taking opiates. So as Mark was showing you, and stealing my thunder here, is that you now have um, this very different concept of these, micro, these microglial cells and what, what it is that these cells are really doing. So, you know, the, the classical view of what these glial cells are is here. They look like, under the microscope, little statues. Little statues going nowhere. But when you can now image them in live, intact brain. What you now see instead is that this is the real view of the microglial cells. They are surveying. They are looking for problems. They are feeling up your entire extracellular space every two minutes. Doesn't that tickle? Now, what you see when they're doing this is that this is a close-up of an arm or a leg, I never know which, but they're extending and contracting and really sleuthing out for problems. Now, this is the same image that you saw a moment ago, uh, and this is another image, much like what Mark had shown, that when you have damage that occurs, this will, this will not loop, so you, this is, will only happen the one time. When the damage occurs, all the microglial cells respond and attack. So when these cells now become activated, they would start releasing a whole host of substances that we know amplify pain. Excitatory amino acids, prostaglandins, uh, reactive oxygen species, and so on. But it's not, doesn't even stop just there. In addition, what these cells are doing is they amplify pain signaling from the body to the spinal cord. They call too much transmitter to get released after you've stepped on a nail then now you have way too much pain transmitter coming into the spinal cord, and they amplify pain messaging up to the brain. So they upregulate AMPAs and NMDA receptors, which are fundamental to amplification of pain by neurons. They downregulate uh, inhibitory transmitters. They mess up the outward currents that would normally keep cells to be nice and calm and, and reasonable. And they downregulate a whole variety of, of things that normally keep the whole system under control. So when you put the whole picture together, you have massive amplification of the pain message. And thanks to Mike Daly, another image of his beautiful glial cells, that when these glial cells become activated, they start spewing these, these pain-enhancing substances. And from what our lab and many others now have, have found out is that these family of pro-inflammatory cytokines, especially interleukin-1, are absolutely critical. So if they're getting activated and they're spewing all this bad stuff, causing all these problems, the question comes up, what causes them to activate? Well, all of these things do. And what's intriguing about this list is that we as pain people have known for years that we could control pain by blocking substance P or CGRP, blocking ATP, glutamate, nitric oxide, all these things. And we always thought it was because we were blocking the activation of neurons. But what this list implies is that those methods may also be effective in part because they're blocking the activation of glial cells as well. So you're knocking out their contribution. So let's just take a few of these to talk about more. Let's talk about endogenous danger signals drugs of abuse, and particularly opiates. It turns out that glial cells don't like morphine. They don't like methadone either. So if you give a rat radiant heat to the tail or to the paws, what you see is a normal everyday rat will then flick its paw away from the radiant heat after about two seconds, which is what these lines are. These are just the normal everyday control. But if you give this rat morphine or methadone over the spinal cord, what you see is it now takes not two seconds, but more like, oh, eight to 10 seconds before they finally respond. So that's shown here that there now it takes much longer time before they can escape the heat. And then over time, because this is time, the analgesia wears away and 
It looks like it's all gone, right? Or is that a trick question? It's not gone. You just can't see it. What I mean by that is if we now give the animal a cytokine antagonist, an interleukin-1 antagonist over spinal cord, the analgesia comes back. It's not gone. It's just hidden. So what we think is really going on is that when you give morphine, you produce pain suppression, and that that pain suppression should just decay over time as the drug clears, as the drug's broken down. But identically time is that the opiates are not only suppressing pain through the neurons, they're activating the glial cells that create pain-enhancing substances to amplify pain. So that what you perceive, what you measure from the animal, is a summation of pain suppression plus pain enhancement. So it is the summation of the two that is your behavioral readout. So when you think the pain, the analgesia is gone, it's really not, because if you now block the glial component, the analgesia comes right back. And what is really cool about this whole thing is that the actions of opiates on glial cells and the actions of opiates on neurons are separable. As you know, there are, in chemistry, things called mirror image molecules. They call them pluses and minuses for the different halves of the mirror. So they're, very, they're identical structures except the opposites of each other. And this is important for neurons because a neuron opiate receptor can only bind minus. This is critical, can only bind minus. So that when you're talking about neurons, that the they can be mirror images of each other, but have dramatically different effects. So that the minus opiates are powerful analgesics, and the plus opiates are not. And we, this all comes down to fit. So with a neuronal opiate receptor, it simply is a matter of fit that minus opiates will fit the receptor, plus opiates cannot. And this extends to the antagonists as well. That is, that the minus naloxones, minus naltrexones can bind and block the opiate receptor, the plus naloxones cannot. But the glial cells are different. The glial cells are equal opportunity employers. They like plus and minus both quite well, thank you very much. So both the minus and the plus will fit. Both of them activate the glial cell. And the, they also have equal effects on the glial cells in terms of creating pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this extends to the antagonist, so that both minus and plus will block the glial cell uh, receptor. And that's important. Why that's important is because that says that the plus naloxone should potentiate morphine analgesia, should make opiates work better by not blocking the effects of, of opiates on neurons, so you get pain control, but it removing glial activation that is opposing that is creating pain enhancement that opposes the ability of opiates to inhibit pain, and that's true. So if you give animals morphine, you produce a beautiful analgesia over time. If you simply give them plus naloxone that has no effect on neurons, you now potentiate the analgesia both in terms of potency as well as duration. And this is, what is critical here is that this says that the, act, that the effects of morphine should be separable. That is, if you want to make them work better for pain control in people, that what you should be able to do is either structurally modify morphine, for example, so it fails to bind the glial receptor, or create a longer-lasting version of plus naloxone, which is only going to be a lock in glial cells. So for us to be able to target it, we have to know what this receptor is. And it turns out that it turns out that it's a, called a toll-like receptor 4, TLR4. And this is what is classically thought of as the not me, not right, not okay receptor. This is a receptor that will, for example, detect bacteria, but it also detects endogenous danger signals. And what endogenous danger signals are is little bits of you that's not supposed to be floating around free in the extracellular space, little bits of your DNA, your RNA, your cell membranes, little bits that say, I've been damaged. 
And as we'll see, this is going to be very important in things like chronic pain, that this is going to be a way that the glial cells are getting activated. But what we've discovered is that they also get activated by every single clinically relevant class of opiates. So everything that we've done on this model fits the following. That is that if you now get minus opiates like minus morphine, they bind two places, not one. Neurons make analgesia. Binding to the glial cells make pro-inflammatory cytokines that amplify pain and minimizes the ability of morphine to control pain. It works in opposition. But if you give instead things like plus naloxone, it can't see the neurons. It can't bind there, but it can take the glial cells out of commission so that they're not producing the pro-inflammatory cytokine. So morphine now works unopposed to allow a much more profound analgesic state. Now, this is toll-like receptor 4. This green caterpillar is who we're after. You'd think it'd be easy to squish, but he's pretty small. So you got this big caterpillar with a co-receptor MD2 that works along with it. And what we're designing in silico, in, in computer modeling, is looking at how opiates, how endogenous danger signals, how naloxone, how all these different compounds interact and disrupt the signaling of this cascade. So we are now using this to help us design new drugs in order to target this, this uh, receptor. And we can see it. Even uh, this is going to be just an example of one of the assays that we use uh, to be able to visualize the fact that opiates are activating toll like receptor 4. These cells are ones that um, chronically express green fluorescent protein on an on a entity that's downstream from toll like receptor 4. So it is a readout of toll like receptor 4 having become activated. And what you will see under basal conditions is this nice, even green glow. So nice, even green glow. And that's what's going to change in just a moment when we add morphine. When you add morphine to the cells, what you see is it rushes to the membrane. There's now this green lunar eclipse going on with all these little solar flares coming off the cells, showing that these cells are now activated and by morphine. And you can block this with plus naloxone. You can block it with standard L uh, TLR4 inhibitors and so forth. So you can see the effect that these opiates are activating that cell. So keep in mind that we said that the, this whole like receptor 4 is that not me, not right, not okay receptor that's seeing things like endogenous danger signals. So if it's true that it's getting activated by endogenous danger signals, what that says is that if we blocked toll-like receptor 4, which is seeing this endogenous danger signals, shouldn't that mean it could be a standalone drug for treating neuropathic pain? And it is. So in response to nerve injury, you have a fall in pain threshold. Animals are escaping from about a half a gram of force instead of nearly 10. But if you now start plus naloxone going into the animal over the spinal cord, neuropathic pain melts away and it's gone. So if this is true that it's because we're blocking glial activation, then that means that we should be able to see that. So we collect the tissue at the end of the time course, and what we see in the nerve injury animals is all this glial activation. The fact that all these little dots are much darker than the control animal means that these glial cells are chubbier and darker and means that they're activated. But with plus naloxone, this activation has gone away. And just to mess with your minds a little bit, it's not just glia. Introducing endothelial cells, the lining of your blood vessels in your brain. These endothelial cells are immune-like in the sense that they too can detect things like uh, foreign agents, things like damage, things like opiates that are binding to the toll-like receptor 4. And what this shows you is that in response to morphine, you have a big increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines that is blocked in these cells by blocking toll-like receptor 4. And it's not just spinal cord, and it's not just pain that, that's, that's being implicated, that's getting affected here. What I wanted to share here is that it's much bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. So if you are taking opiates, one of the problems with, with opiates is drug abuse. And having the, the, the drugs now 
ferreted over into drug reward, um, into drug abuse potentials. And what, so what we wanted to know was to find out whether or not this toll-like receptor 4 is not just regulating pain and opiates for, for pain control, but whether it's regulating drug reward as well. And there's a couple of different ways that you can study drug reward in a rat. They don't go out in the street and try to get drugs. But the way that you study it in rat, one is neurochemical, is in that you're looking at the release of a reward transmitter called dopamine in a brain reward site like the nucleus accumbens. So that when you give a rat morphine, for example, you see a big rise in the, in the release of dopamine in this drug reward center over time. But if you give them plus naloxone, if you block toll-like receptor 4, you don't. And this is true for cocaine as well. The cocaine dramatically increases dopamine release, the drug reward center, and plus naloxone blocking toll-like receptor 4 blocks that as well. The second way that you can look at drug reward in a rat is that you use something that's called the condition place preference paradigm. This is a paradigm where if you go someplace, you think of it like this. If you go someplace you've never been before and something just horrible, evil, awful happens to you there, you don't like that place, and you avoid it. But if you go someplace you've never been before and something just exquisitely wonderful happens to you there, you like that place. It feels good to be there. And rats are the same. So when you have this little rat, and he goes to a new place he's never been before, and he goes around, and he thinks this is pretty cool. He's got two different boxes. Isn't that fun? And then so the next day you bring them in, and you say, oh, good. Well, you either get morphine in one side, or if you get saline in the other. And then you bring the rat back another day. And if the rat had gotten, for example, saline on both sides, he still doesn't care one side of the box versus the other. But if he had a really good drug like morphine, he, you basically can't peel them out of there. It feels good to be there. But if he'd had plus naloxone to block his toll-like receptor 4, it doesn't feel very rewarding at all. So this is the increase in time spent bouncing around that one box where he got a really good drug before. And with morphine or cocaine, you see a big increase in the amount of time they like that box. But if plus naloxone is given, there is no evidence of drug reward. So both neurochemical with dopamine and behavioral with this kind of a test. And now through the wonderfulness of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, who's chosen this drug to move forward for fast tracking into clinical trials, we now also know that this works for several other uh, self-administration, relapse, and a, and a variety of other reward kinds of, of paradigms. So putting it all together, all the data, what the data say is that if you block glial activation, if you block uh, the, what you're going to do is suppress pathological pain due to peripheral nerve injury, bone cancer, multiple sclerosis, a whole host, every animal model that has been looked at that's clinically relevant. You make opiates work better for pain. You take away the bad side effects. You even suppress respiratory depression and constipation. And it's not just opiates. And we now know that a lot of these same things are going to be happening in, in terms of being good effects of blocking this receptor on these glial cells and endothelial cells from alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine. The list goes on. I'll give you just one example of alcohol. So these are our drunk mouse studies. So we're studying drunk mice. And in the first panel, we're trying to find out whether blocking toll-like receptor 4 might improve some of the problems that you get with alcohol. And this one's starting ataxia, and that is, is a sedation. So in ataxia, what you're, we're doing is we've taken this mouse, and we're putting them on a rotating rod and asking how long it takes before he falls off. Drunk mice running on a rod, they're really terrible at this really terrible at this. And what you see in wild type animals is it's really terrible. This is the amount of time they spend running before they go in 
it's almost immediate. Um, but if they simply give them plus naloxone or you knock out toll like receptor 4, they run pretty darn good before they finally fall off. Sedation, you're measuring, if you give them even a higher dose of alcohol, they fall asleep. You know if you've had too much to drink, you fall asleep. And they do too. And the wild type animals fall asleep for a long time. If you block with plus naloxone or toll like receptor 4 knockout, very little sleep. Ataxia, sedation, all gone. We predict it for reward as well. We don't yet have the equipment to do it, but we're working on it. So take this all together. What I've been telling you is if you have peripheral nerve injury, you have amplification of the pain. Amplification of the pain is in part with, because of the activation of these pesky little glial cells. And what is perverse is that when you try to treat it with something like morphine, the little red pill, you make things worse. Because now the morphine, like the neuropathic pain, is further activating glial cells, further driving pro-inflammatory cytokines, causing problems. So what we want is a little blue pill. I want the little blue pill. I, whether it's plus naloxone or whether it's interleukin 10 gene therapy that I'm going to show you about um, in a few minutes, which Aaron Milligan began in our laboratory, the little blue pill, the best of all worlds, is that it would not only treat neuropathic pain in and of itself, but it would allow things like morphine to work better without making the side effects worse. That's what I want. So a different avenue, totally different avenue, a new area that we're getting into, which is uh, pretty fun, has to do with glial priming. The question of why does acute pain become chronic? Why does acute pain become chronic? Well, we think we know one answer. It has to do with glial cells. Surprise, it has to do with glial cells. And something that's called priming. OK, so what we all know and love about the little statues on the microscope, little photos of the little statues in the microscope, that's the basal state of glial cells. They're boring. They're vigilant, but they're boring. Okay? But when they get then activated into a the activated state, they start spewing out pro-inflammatory cytokines. But once they become activated, the question then is, what happens then? So they can either go back down to baseline, or they can enter what's called a prime state. This is kind of like if I walk up to you and you don't know me, and I just kind of come up close and suddenly smack you across the face, I'll probably get away with it the first time. You're not going to let me get away with it twice. And the glial cells are the same way. They're ready now. You do something to them, now they're ready. And if you now do something else to them, now they're now going to explode into action much faster, much stronger, much longer, and we think is contributing for the, to the change from acute pain into chronic because they now over-respond. And we now that know that these cells can become prime through aging. Midlife on, that's not fair. Midlife on, these cells are becoming more and more and more primed under conditions of stress, trauma, and opiates. And all these things can prime the glial cells. So what we're working on is what we call this two-hit hypothesis, where the first hit could be aging, stress, trauma, inflammation, opiates, whatever you want to do. Then they get primed, you give them a second hit, and then that's what we want to know. Does that change acute pain into chronic? And so for the first test we did, uh, the first hit we did something that happens to thousands of Americans every year, which is exploratory abdominal surgery. Anytime you have something going wrong and they want to go in and take a poke about, that's what this is. So we do, it was designed by anesthesiologists and surgeons to mimic what happens to people. And so we do exploratory abdominal surgery, wait a few weeks, two weeks, more weeks, whatever, and then we give them a, a challenge and find out what happens to their pain. And what we see at the time of uh, the testing is that this is a glial activation marker in the animals that had laparotomy, the exploratory surgery. You see that they do maintain activation markers being expressed. The animals that get, did not have surgery or had a sham condition, give the, the low, low, low dose challenge. It does nothing to them, no pain change. But if they'd had exploratory surgery weeks before 
and now you give them this little tiny challenge that does nothing to a normal rat, you have a fall in pain threshold that then comes up. It changes no pain to pain. No pain to pain. So what happens if you had pain? Could that now acute pain turn into chronic pain? So we do this abdominal surgery again, different groups of rats, of course. And then later on, we give them a more potent ch challenge. Now here, they're getting bladder inflammation. They're getting bladder inf sterile bladder inflammation. There's no bacteria, but because we don't want to have that kind of a confound of whether or not it's the bacteria growing or whatever, you have a bladder inflammation. And in rats, when you have a bladder inflammation, it has referred pain down to the paws. So you can measure this very easily. So animals that had no prior surgery, you have this, uh, with bladder inflammation, you have a transient increase in pain, uh, a lowering of pain threshold that then resolves. But if you'd had abdominal surgery, laparotomy, weeks before, and now you get this uh, same bladder inflammation, what you see is a far more profound pain that the, st the study stopped at three months. There was no evidence of the pain returning to normal. It turned acute pain into chronic pain simply by having the glial cells activated weeks before. And what's really cool is that if at the time of the initial surgery we gave them a glial activation inhibitor, what you see is now if you give them a bladder inflammation, it's like they never had surgery. They look just like a rat who'd never had anything happen to them at all. So it raises the possibility, which we're now pursuing, thank you National Institutes of Health who just gave us a five-year grant to do this, that we're now studying this kind of phenomenon to try to find out if you could prevent acute pain from becoming chronic by either treating at the time of the first event or by, even more importantly, treating later before the second event. See if we can reverse the problem before it starts. So in terms of looking across all the data, what's really exciting at this point is some of these things are now approaching clinical trials, which is really great news in my, in my mind. Uh, we've helped with three of the approaches that are starting to approach, trying to approach clinical trials. Um, one is with uh, Avigen and now Medicinova for a compound that, that we've worked with from them. Uh, it has passed not only uh, phase two neuropathic pain trials in Australia and is approved in the U.S. Uh, they had a, a, a Colorado, uh, sorry, not Colorado, Columbia, University Attic trial based on our data with glial cells and, and drugs of abuse, which was successful uh, with heroin addicts. And there's a UCLA methamphetamine trial that's underway as well. Uh, adenosine therapeutics has a fun compound that I don't have time to tell you about tonight because what I want to do, especially in honor of Erin, is to talk to you about something that she began that is now in, has, has received, uh, which is exciting, very exciting, uh, a new grant from the National Institutes of Health to try to take Erin's uh, interleukin 10 gene therapy uh, toward clinical trials. Uh, so what we're doing here in has been adopted by Salute Therapeutics, uh, pronounced Salute as in to your health. The X is for Roman numeral 10, in acknowledging the role of interleukin 10. This is a non-viral gene therapy. And the whole purpose of this, we've been talking all along here about pro-inflammatory cytokines. Pro-inflammatory cytokines being pain enhancing, being bad for opiate allergies, being bad for everything. That this is driving an anti-inflammatory, powerful anti-inflammatory cytokine. And it's given one injection over a spinal cord, and its job is to suppress the entire family of pro-inflammatory side. You don't want to block one, the others take over. You want to get the whole gang all wrapped up in trust. So you're going to, all, every which way but loose, interleukin-10 should be controlling everything bad. And let me show you that this is true. So these animals on top are really boring control animals. Well, the animals in red are the ones that are important. They have nerve injury, so this is fall and pain threshold. They're escaping from light touch has now become pain. Uh, in our hands, if you would then test them for three months, they would remain stably, uh, very neuropathic. But instead, what we now give them is this interleukin-10 gene therapy over spinal cord. And what you see is a neuropathic pain fades away, and it is gone. 
And that's not just this one model. The strength of knowing whether something is going to work in people, I believe, is doing lots of different animal models, which is what we've been doing. This is now a model of chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain. Chemotherapeutics for treating cancers don't just kill cancers. They damage nerves, and you end up with neuropathic pain. Um, at this point, the animals either get a vehicle, which does nothing, they're still just as neuropathic, or you now give them the interleukin-10 gene therapy, and the pain goes away. One treatment, gone for months. And it's not just pain. This is a model we got into it because we wanted to study central neuropathic pain of multiple sclerosis. But we found something even more intriguing along the way. This is an animal model of multiple sclerosis called EAE. And in this model, it's kind of like when you go, you guys all get flu vaccinations, right? So you go out and you get your flu vaccination, and so your body starts creating antibodies against the flu. So we give them an injection of their own myelin, and they create antibodies against themselves. And so in this model, after they have a period of time, you now have a point where the animals start to become symptomatic. And in this model, in a rat model, in paralysis is, is developed with multiple sclerosis, the paralysis begins at the very tip of the tail and spreads forward, not as a wave, but as more and more and more and more higher percentage of the body is paralyzed. And so the, at zero, they're completely normal. The bigger the number, the more the body that's paralyzed. So this is before they get treatment. This is a normal, everyday animal. What you see is really good control of their tail. Rats are prehensile with their tails. They have great motor control and great motor tone. But before treatment, what you see here is that he has developed antibodies and the tail is now paralyzed. That is when we now give them the treatment. And what you see over the course of time is the animals that did not get interleukin-10 gene therapy go through a relapsing, remitting course of paralysis and remission and paralysis and remission, just like humans do. But if you had the lucky group and you got the interleukin-10 gene therapy, what you see is instead you get this little tiny relapse instead of this huge thing. And at the end of the study, they're normal. So what these animals look like at the end of the study is as follows. This animal had been paralyzed. That animal is now no different than an animal who'd never been given antibodies to create multiple sclerosis. The other guys that did not get the therapy have more and more paralysis that are in involved. It's a very dramatic therapy with dramatic results. And what this therapy is doing, as you saw from the previous slide, is that with the peripheral nerve injury, as the example, you have this amplification of pain with the activation of glial cells. And what the interleukin-10 gene therapy is doing is calming down the hot and bothered glial cells, returning them to normal. So you can kind of think as, this is Valium for glia. You can think of it as California Mellow. You can think of it as a very different approach, not only now for neuropathic pain, making opiates work better, and we hope to prove that it is going to be a therapy that will improve the lives of people with multiple sclerosis, not only for pain, because it cured that pain as well, but also in terms of helping relieve the paralysis, which is a major problem in that disease state. So, conclusions. The first conclusion probably sounds silly, but it isn't. And that is that immunology is important. It has been forever that pain people have fervently ignored immunology, and immunologists have fervently ignored pain, and that just can't continue. And fortunately, there's a lot of people now attracted into studying immune cells and glial cells, and it's, it's really remarkable. The, if you do PubMed alerts, uh, PubMed searches, the just explosion of papers that are in this area. You can think about these glial cells as volume controls. Glial cells do not have axons. Glial cells cannot affect messages. Um, they can't send messages to the brain. They're local gossips. They affect neurons that are nearby and thereby affect pain. They do not care about normal everyday pain. So if you stub your toe or you cut yourself shaving, your glial cells do not care. Your glial cells love you, but they do not care about normal everyday pain. Something has to trigger these cells to activate. You have to change their state. And you can change their state 
physiologically is a normal part of a sickness response, which we didn't have time to talk about, but the concept is very simple. The last time you had the ugly, ugly flu and you didn't feel like partying till 4 a.m. and even the bed sheets hurts, that's your glial cells talking to you. They are ch cause, changing your, how your brain works in response to things like the flu to help you survive. Physiologically, when they're activated in that state, is a wonderful thing. But pathologically, you get activated by peripheral nerve injury, by cancer, by RSDS, we believe, and pharmacologically, by clinically relevant opiates, by drugs of abuse. The glial cells are now linked, as I showed you, to tolerance, dependence, reward, respiratory depression, the list goes on. So finding a way in order to now control these glial cells and the glial cell products, we believe, is going to be a major step forward in finding a way to control pain and making opiates work better clinically. So I hope, though I've only talked about a small facet of what these glial cells are really involved in, they are involved in so many things, with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ischemia and stroke, and the list goes on and on and on. But using this just as like one simple example, I hope you get the idea that it really is a great need to find a way to image in these pro-inflammatory processes in the variety of glial cells that are involved, in endothelial cells that line your blood vessels that get exposed to all these drugs of abuse, and they're the first ones exposed to morphine when you're given it for pain, the glial cells and beyond. And so I hope that this conference will do great things in, in, or in terms of being able to help facilitate the imaging of processes like this. I'd like to thank especially Aaron Milligan, who began not only the interleukin 10 gene therapy work, but did the first opiates work in, in our lab on, on glial cells. Mark Hutchinson, who led all of the um, opiate work and total like receptor 4 work that I've shown you here today. And Steve Mayer, with whom I run a joint lab. That's Stephen. That's our dog, Ike, on a snowshoe near a cabin. So life is just rough. Thank you very, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good questions. And ketamine, we have not studied, so I don't want to hazard a guess as to whether or not it is acts at toll like receptors or even glial cells generally. But what what that does feed into is that it's it's they work together. So when you have these stimulations, you're also going to be getting the glial cells activated because things that the neurons are releasing, like glutamates and ATP and vermicrotide, all those kinds of things that when NMDA things open, they start producing prostaglandin and so on. Um, the chemokines, like MCP1, the variety of things that neurons are going to be releasing, fractal kind, there's a variety of neuron to glia signals. So even if, you th even if the experiment is set up such that the only stimulation is of the neuron itself, which you could do depending upon how it was set up. So that the, the stimulation is actually only on axons on the outside. Keep in mind, okay, keep in mind the parallel process here. Keep in mind that you're talking about electrical stimulation, activated NMDA, and so on, but you can translate that to nerve injury out in the body, activating glial cells. So in both cases, assuming that your experiment is set up so that the stimulation is distant, um, the nerve injury is distant. So the question then arises, how do the glial cells know you have a nerve injury out in your body? I mean, that's out here. They're in there. How do they know? So the, the answer comes up as to what it is that the neurons then tell the glial cells. How it is that the glial cells heard about the fact that you had damage or electrical stimulation or whatever. And that then comes into play with there's a number of neuron to glial signals that can very rapidly activate them. Things like fractalkine and MCP1 and substance P and glutamate and a variety of things like that. So they talk to each other. Yeah? Can I, can I follow yeah. That's, I, I completely understand what you're saying as far as parallel processes, but my question was more specific about we use ketamine clinically to block the receptor on the neurons. Now, well, they are, the, the, the NMDA receptors are also on glial cells. So if you're using it to block NMDA receptors, you're using it to block NMDA receptors. It's not cell type specific. Gotcha. That's what makes sense. Because my question was, because we do, it's like as an anesthesiologist, for example, a patient has surgery in the abdomen and the head, like neurosurgeons sometimes do. And they, like, would you want to put an epidural? It will create. There's nothing will be, will be felt in the abdomen, but the head will still hurt, so you're not right. really screaming anything. I might, my thought was that if you were to block something in a glia and neuron would still do it. But if it works, it's not really parallel processes in our synergistics. 
Right. They're syner synergistic, but if you just block the glial cells, you will not block pain. They will not produce analgesia. So in your situation, you want analgesia for the patient at that point in time. So blocking glial cells will only return pain to normal. Uh, it will not produce an analgesic state. So to kill pain, you want an analgesic. To return individuals to normal is what you would do by blocking the glial cell activation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The question that has to do with the two-hit model that I was, I was telling you about, and the comment was people are not genetically all the same. Some people develop chronic pain after the first injury. Some people, it's after multiple. And my response to that would be that I'm not sure that the first injury was the first hit. So it is actually striking. One of the things that has struck me in talking to care providers um, is one of the comments that, that, that I've had multiple uh, medical providers tell me is that they have patients coming in and saying, I had chronic pain and then it became under control and then I got the flu and then the pain came back. And so in, in our mind, that first hit was not actually long before and thought to be resolved as an example. Absolutely. And they don't develop it. So what is, what is protecting them and not protecting them? Instead of looking at it as a vulnerability, I look at it as what is protecting them, what's protecting them. And, I th and that's a wonderful question. That I'm hoping at the end of the five-year grant that just came in, I will have better answers for you for that. <laughs> at least I'll still be employed for five years. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, EAE model? model? Yeah. Right. Right. Well, once the neurons are dead, that's, we can't help them then. Uh, but if it's, sh it depends on, that's a very good question. Um, It, de it depends in part of how far the damage has gone and whether you want... Actually, I'm, I don't think there's going to be a time limit on at least helping to improve the situation, keep the other neurons from continuing to die. You may be able to arrest it. You can't bring back the neuron that's too terribly damaged. Part of, the part of where I'm pausing here is that when you have this damage within the central nervous system, and one of the things, one of the reasons that we think a lot of these states continue for so long, is that Ben Barris um, published a beautiful review a couple years ago on why it is that that nerve that if you have damage out in your body, your immune system deals with it very rapidly. You clean it up, and it's all gone. But within the central nervous system, that doesn't happen that this degeneration keeps going and going and going and going and going for years. So in part, it has to do with how much damage is already there as to how easy it's going to be controlled and how soon you can reverse the problem, and at least put a stop to it. Uh, so we're uh, trying to raise funds now for the, the multiple sclerosis model, both for studying it for the interleukin 10 gene therapy, but also for another compound that I referred to in passing, the A2A agonist. The A2A agonist, um, the adenosine therapeutics compound, is really an intriguing, intriguing compound. It actually, with a single injection, can reverse neuropathic pain for six or eight weeks. Um, but we, it does so by changing the activation state of the glial cell. So that instead of now producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, when they get stimulated, anti-inflammatory cytokines come out. The reason that I'm talking, uh, mentioning that, because that is, again, with that EAE model, shows the same thing. We have animals, when they are responsive to this compound, their paralysis goes away and they're stable for as long as we've tested them. And whereas the animals that are not responsive go back into relapsing, remitting, 
and, and go on toward that. So there's some kind of trigger. There's some, something that you can trigger to have this really enduring, powerful effect. Uh, well, we need to find out, for example, how late in the EAE process, because we've only tested it up front. We need to take it out longer and address your question about how late is not late enough. Yeah, Raja. I've been intrigued by studies for a long period of time. Thank you. So my simple mind has some difficulty understanding one aspect of this. So Just one? one? That's good. Ten fold BDL compared to zero. You know, they're not there primarily to use pneumatic pain. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. So if one blocks the function of these cells, you know, what is the potential downside in terms of their protective physiological effect? Right. Very good question. Question is, um, here I am spouting that we ought to, ought to control these pesky little glial cells, but there must be a downside to this. And there definitely is a very bad downside if you are trying to kill them, if you're trying to actually suppress them. That's not what interleukin 10 does. What interleukin 10 does is take away the activation, the pro-inflammatory activation, and returns them to a basal state. I'm trying to return them to the state that you want them to be in. So there are very bad things that happen if you, there, there are ways that you can do the studies in a rat for research purpose that would be totally not appropriate for a person. So there are drugs like fluorocitrate, fluoracetate. These are metabolic poisons that only target things like astrocytes. And what you see when you take out these really good cells is, and you're not just calming them to normal, you're taking them out, is that you go into seizures because what these cells do is they take up glutamate. So when you metabolically poison them, glutamate starts to rise, you can get seizures, you can get all kinds of bad things. Uh, you don't want to kill off your microglial cells. You want them there surveying. You want them there for a variety of purposes that they can help you with. So I'm not advocating killing off glial cells. I'm, I'm advocating trying to do something like interleukin-10, like blocking the a single receptor that makes them reactive and trying to get them. I kind of, I have this, you all know the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You all do, right? Yes, you're awake still? Good. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm, thank you so much for still being awake. Um, the, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, these are, you know, this translates to glial cells. Okay, so Dr. Jekyll, we all know, is this fine upstanding physician, a great, you know, cornerstone of his community and so on and so forth. But he has this penchant for turning into this evil Mr. Hyde. And that's the way I kind of image these, these glow cells, is you don't want to kill Mr. Hyde, you want to turn him back into Dr. Jekyll. And so that, that's, that's the kind of image that, that I get when we're talking about things like interleukin 10, because that's the aim. You want Mr. Hyde to become Dr. Jekyll permanently. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. In the literature, you know, there are reports of uh, uh, naltrexone, you know, individuals treating with naltrexone, uh, um, suffering overdose, uh, overdoses when they relapse to abusing heroin. Right. And uh, the mechanism is suspected uh, um, to, to be caused by sprouting of uh, the immune opioid uh, receptor. Mm -hmm. um, which then, of course, leads to respiratory depression, etc. And I'm just wondering if uh, the same happens uh, in, uh, in the glial cells, if, if there's an upregulation of the receptor, and what does that ultimately mean uh, in terms of uh, immunomodulation? Good question. Uh, and since he's in the back of the room, I'm going to guess everybody heard it, so I don't have to repeat that. Um, in terms of what the glial cells do, in terms what we know on, let's take a couple of examples. Uh, with the interleukin 10 gene therapy, for example, when you now have this beautiful reversal of neuropathic pain for a prolonged period of time, after a while it wears off. We think because the cells are dividing, they finally pop out the gene therapy, and so you lose it, and neuropathic pain comes back. What, if we give them another dose of the gene therapy, what we see is an identical reversal. So no worse, no better, but a beautiful reversal. So they certainly have not become tolerant. And from what we can see, they haven't become hyperreactive either. Uh, in terms of the toll-like receptors, uh, that is an active area where we're investigating, but what we, have, what we 
C is upregulation of toll like receptors when the glial cells, because of the trauma or the stress or the drugs of abuse, they upregulate so that the cells become more reactive. But with plus naltrexone, we have never seen an upregulation of toll like receptor 4. So I'm very hopeful that your scenario is not going to be a problem for us, but it is something that we are watching for. Yeah? Yes, well, in terms of one of the last points that I made, physiologically as a sickness response. Let's go back to this. Okay, so let's talk physiology rather than pathology. Because as soon as you step into pathology, all bets are off because Mother Nature didn't design it that way. So if we're talking about how Mother Nature would in, intended this system to work, if I could get it to Mother Nature's head, let's think about what they do normally. So normally, what the astrocytes do is, and they've all long been thought of as genitorial help. They clean up debris. They suck up glutamate. They suck up stuff. They, they deliver nutrients to neurons. They deliver neurotransmitter precursors so neurons can make things. They sweep up the environment. Basic, they're basically janitors for the, for the astrocytes. They're, they're, they've been always considered just clean up debris. Microglial cells were always statues. Nobody thought they did anything until there was a trauma and then they would respond. But when you actually start talking about physiology and what these cells do, one of the things that they do is that they create things like the sickness response. If we can use that just as a physiological example. So if you have a flu, what you end up experiencing is one increases in sleep, fever, decreases in food and water intake, massive changes in your blood. So it starves the bacteria from some minerals and ions that they need to divide and multiply and supplies what your white blood cells need to re uh, multiply very quickly. It does tremendous, you know, the bed sheets hurt. All these things are happening to you. And if you start, and you stop and you analyze what's going on, fever, sleep, feeding, pain, hormone changes, and so on and so on, your brain's creating those. And when people started to investigate, how is it that your brain knew you were sick? The flu virus doesn't get to your brain. How did your brain know to do this? And what came out of those studies, and that's where we started 20 years ago, um, 20 years ago, people were starting to ask these questions about how did your brain know you were sick, and what controls that? And it turns out that your immune system talks to your brain through a variety of pathways, but it creates the sickness response by activating glial cells. 